Hierbij I open this academic ceremony in which Ellen Boama Kali will defend her academic thesis, Do Girls Have Needs? Individual and Environmental Determinants of Hormonal Contraceptive Use Among Adolescent Girls in Kintampo Communities of Ghana. Candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your work? Dear Prorector, dear Assessment Committee members, my dear supervisors, hope and abroad, family, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am very excited and highly privileged to talk to you about the work that I have been doing in the past few years for my PhD work on hormonal contraceptive use among adolescents in Kentampo, Ghana. So, teenage pregnancy is a global public health problem, but it disproportionately affects people from marginalized communities characterized by poverty, low levels of education, and limited job opportunities. And so, in low and middle income countries alone, about 21 million adolescent girls become pregnant every year. Unfortunately, half of all these pregnancies are unintended. Therefore, more than half of all these unintended pregnancies end up being terminated, usually through unsafe methods. In Ghana, 14% of adolescent girls have begun childbearing. But why is this a problem and why do we care? We need to care because teenage pregnancy, whether intended or not, has health, social, and economic consequences for the adolescents involved, her family, and society at large. For example, health-wise, pregnancy and delivery-related complications are the number one reason why girls 15 to 19 years die. Also, most of them drop out of school because of pregnancy, and hence they have limited job opportunities. They are unable to care for themselves, they are unable to care for their children, and would likely become a burden on society. Children born to adolescent girls have very poor outcomes, and because they have limited opportunities in life, they will likely become low achievers and become a burden on family and society. For these reasons, we need to care about teenage pregnancy and do something about it. But what is the way forward? So for pregnancies to be prevented, adolescents have to be completely abstained from sexual intercourse. Unfortunately, we know that most of adolescent girls are sexually active. And so for those who are sexually active, if they correctly and consistently use contraceptive methods, they will be able to prevent pregnancy from occurring and then avert the consequences that come with it. Unfortunately, only a few girls worldwide are able to use any form of contraception for pregnancy prevention. And even for those who do, most of them rely on condoms. But for condoms to work effectively to prevent pregnancy, they have to be used correctly and consistently. Unfortunately, there is a huge challenge with correct and consistent condom use because the biggest challenge is that most of these girls lack the autonomy to demand for condom use. Again, many of them do not have the negotiation skills to persuade their partners to use condoms. So this is a big problem. Therefore, the use of hormonal contraceptives could be a better option because they are highly effective at pregnancy prevention, and then the girls themselves can have control over their use. An even better option would be to do a dual protection, that is using condom in addition to a hormonal contraceptive method so that girls can be fully protected from pregnancy as well as sexually transmitted infections. So now, to be able to help girls use both condoms and hormonal contraceptives, one needs to understand all the factors that influence the use of condoms as well as the use of hormonal contraceptives. Luckily, there's unlimited data explaining why adolescents are able to use condoms. But little is known about the determinants of hormonal contraceptive use. And so in the past few years, I have tried to understand from the perspective of adolescent girls what influenced them to either use hormonal contraceptives or not. And I have done this through a sequential methods approach, doing several different studies using both qualitative and quantitative data collection methods. But qualitative data first, and then their findings measured quantitatively. So in the first study, I tried to understand from the perspective of adolescent girls who have never used a hormonal contraceptive, why they have never been able to do that. And I understood from them, 
through a six, 16 in-depth interviews with 16 girls and then two focus group discussions. And I understood from adolescents that they are influenced at three different levels to explain why they are unable to use hormonal contraceptives. And these are the individual level, the interpersonal level, and at the community level. So at the individual level, adolescents seem to have very limited knowledge on how contraceptives work to prevent pregnancy. And so this led to them having a lot of misconceptions and misapprehensions about using hormonal contraceptives. Also, most of them saw that contraceptives are very bad. They could make them feel sick. They could make them barren in future. And these negative attitudes explain why they do not use hormonal contraceptives. They also felt that using hormonal contraceptives will make them seem like they are very bad girls and could be treated badly within the community. Hence, they wouldn't use them. Again, most of these girls didn't have the confidence to go to health facility to access hormonal contraceptives because they feared that they would be stigmatized against. Therefore, they would not use hormonal contraceptives. In addition to this, many of them feared the side effects, both perceived and real side effects of hormonal contraceptive use. Their biggest fear was that hormonal contraceptives could make them barren in future. Others felt that the implants, for example, could relocate to other parts of the body to cause huge health problems for them and therefore they would not use them. Again, most of them wouldn't feel comfortable for people around them to see that they use hormonal contraceptives because they felt that they could be stigmatized against. This fear of disclosure also explains at the individual level why these girls never use hormonal contraceptives. At the interpersonal level, we understood that adolescents are influenced by their peers, their parents, and partners to explain why they are unable to use hormonal contraceptives. These important people seem not to support hormonal contraceptive use among adolescents because of the negative consequences that adolescents think they would face by using hormonal contraceptives. They perceive that they, they, are, they won't be treated well, so they were not encouraged to use hormonal contraceptives. At the community level, premarital sex is not condoned, both by religious norms and by community norms. And these religious norms are the reasons why the girls will not use hormonal contraceptives. Because once you use hormonal contraceptives, it means that you're having sex, and then you'll be seen by the community to be a very bad girl who does not respect authority, who does not respect the norms of your religion, and so fingers will be pointed at you. Hence, the girls did not use hormonal contraceptives. So after understanding from the perspective of girls who have, who have no experience using hormonal contraceptives, it became very important to also understand from the perspective of those who have experience with hormonal contraceptive use, what motivates them to be able to use their hormonal contraceptives. Also, again, through 16 in that interviews, we understood that the girls are influenced at two different levels to explain why they are able to correctly and consistently use their hormonal contraceptives. At the individual level, the girls took the decision themselves to use hormonal contraceptives, and they felt very comfortable for people around them to know that they were using hormonal contraceptives, and therefore they got the needed help and support from these people to continuously use their hormonal contraceptives. Even in very unfavorable circumstances, they had coping skills to plan and devise means of assessing their hormonal contraceptives and use them with no difficulty. Again, even though there are misconceptions around hormonal contraceptives and their side effects, these girls were able to manage these uh, misconceptions. Therefore, they used their methods with no difficulty. Most of them knew that once they were sexually active, they could easily become pregnant. And so because of these pregnancy risk perceptions, they are better to be safe than sorry. So they would use hormonal contraceptives. A lot of them wanted to become big people in future, doctors, nurses, lawyers. And, for, and because of this reason, they would use hormonal contraceptives to prevent pregnancy so that their future dreams are not shattered. At the environmental level, Parents, partners, peers, and health providers seem to have supportive norms towards hormonal contraceptive use among adolescents. In fact, girls received enough support from these people. Some parents even took their children to the hospital for these methods to be done for them. Health providers encouraged girls to use their methods continuously, even when they had come to take them off. Some partners accompanied their girlfriends to the facility to get their methods, and these supports that they received encouraged them to continue to use their methods. However, 
community and religious norms still could be barriers to hormonal contraceptive use among the girls. According to the theory of planned behavior, the intention to perform any given behavior always precedes the performance of that actual behavior, provided people have the needed skills and barriers do not hinder the behavioral execution process. And so after identifying from the individual level factors that could explain why adolescents do not use hormonal contraceptives or are able to use them, it was critical to find the relative significance of these identified determinants in predicting HCU's intentions so that we would know which of these determinants to target for intervention. And so among 1,203 girls, 15 to 24 years, we conducted a cross-sectional study to measure these outcomes to see their relative significance. Among the entire population, we saw that attitude toward personal hormonal contraceptive use, self-efficacy to access and use hormonal contraceptives, and hormonal contraceptive use experience were very unique in their contribution to the prediction of HCU's intentions among adolescents. Now, we tried to compare this finding among different groups of adolescents, including those who have experienced hormonal contraceptive use, those who do not have this experience, girls 15 to 19 years, because they are the focus of this study, and young women 20 to 24 years. Again, we found that attitude towards personal hormonal contraceptive use and self-efficacy to access and use hormonal contraceptives were very significant in contributing to the prediction of HCU's intentions among these different subgroups of adolescents. So, in conclusion, we have noted that different groups of adolescent girls need different interventions, focusing on different determinants. One size intervention is never a fit for all. However, attitude toward personal hormonal contraceptive use and self-efficacy to access and use hormonal contraceptives are crucial and therefore should be treated as critical endpoints when putting in place any intervention for girls towards hormonal contraceptive use. Again, if girls are able to disclose their hormonal contraceptive use to people around them or the intention to use to people around them, they will get the needed help. And so girls should be provided with the skills to be able to disclose their HCU's intentions or actual use to people around them. Parents, partners, peers, healthcare providers, community and religious opinion leaders are very crucial. In adolescents' decision whether to use hormonal contraceptives or not, these important agents play very critical roles. And therefore, in planning any intervention towards adolescent hormonal contraceptive use, these important others should be considered and provisions made for them. Thank you very much. I now hand over the word to the corrector. Thank you. The opposition will be opened by Professor Zelstra, Professor of Work and Organizational Psychology at Maastricht University. Thank you very much. Um, dear candidate, let me start with compliment you with your study. Uh, I think you have done an interesting work, but also highly relevant in your community, as I understand from the, from the manuscript. Um, however, I'm not here to compliment you with your work, but I'm here to ask you questions, critical questions. And um, my question would be actually, um, as you have just outlined in your presentation, uh, you've done your study among girls, uh, and of course it's about hormonal contraceptives, um, but I wonder whether focusing on girls is not a uh, too, is not too limited as was the problem. I mean, this might have a wider implication. I mean, as you also indicated, the community, etc., is addressed. So I was wondering whether, I mean, um, you shouldn't have done interviews with a wider group, uh, more stakeholders. And maybe my first question is, who would you think would be stakeholders in this study? Thank and you why? very much. Highly esteemed opponent, first for your compliment, and then for your question. What you have said is very important, especially noting my last uh, concluding remark, the fact that there are several stakeholders regarding adolescent hormonal contraceptive use. So indeed, it would have been extremely important to talk to lots of these stakeholders, to know what their opinions are, to target needed intervention for them. So for my, um, if, I, if I needed to do this again, 
In addition to getting the perspective of adolescents, I would want to talk to their boyfriends. I would want to talk to fathers. Sadly, when we talk about contraceptive use, and then we refer to parents, all the attention is on mothers. But I think that fathers play a role. They are parents too. And their decision to whether girls will use hormonal contraceptives could be very important. But this area is so limited. We haven't learned a lot from them. And so if given the opportunity, the group that I would like to target would be fathers, to know how they could contribute to this problem and the conversation of contraceptive use among adolescents. I, I would certainly agree, fathers are important, but I also think that, for instance, boyfriends, husbands, are important. And from what I understand from you, your, your study, I mean, sometimes partners are not even aware that the girls are using hormonal contraceptives. So wouldn't their boyfriends, their partners, be also a very important group to, uh, to interview? Because, well, uh, since the consequences, of course, are having a child or not a child, boys also have a responsibility there. Exactly. So currently, at least there's been some work done among the boyfriends of these girls. And I noted from my study that they receive some sort of support from their boyfriends. So yes, it will be very important to also involve these boys, talk to them, and get to understand their perspectives as well. So yes, it's, it would have been great to include them. And when the opportunity presents itself another time, I would also love to consider including boyfriends to, so, to know what their perspectives are. It's just that for most girls, they feel that, well, it's hormonal contraceptive is my body, is my decision. So one girl said that, if I get pregnant, it is my decision. So I should decide to use it or not. And the important thing about hormonal contraceptives are that girls have control over them. Boys can be supportive, but they could also be barriers to hormonal contraceptive use. And that's one of the most important reasons why we advocate for hormonal contraceptives, because they are very effective, and the girls themselves can have control over them. So here, even if boys are not involved, it's not that much of a problem, but it will be very interesting to include them because for those who also understand after their girlfriends have explained to them that, oh, I think it is good that we prevent pregnancy, we are still young, we are not ready for babies yet, they understand. So given the needed support, boys could also be very um, good in helping their partners to secure their method. So yes, it's, it's good to explore it. And maybe if I got money sometime <laughs> we could do this together <laughs> yeah well don't look to me for money but i do understand your point uh, but okay we have now uh, extended the list uh, of stakeholders to fathers and boyfriends but yeah. would there be other parties that you would want to interview next time yes i th i'm thinking about religious leaders yeah. and community opinion leaders in terms of chiefs and queen mothers i've not seen any I mean, there's limited literature. Usually it's perceptions about what they think would happen, what they think. But really, we haven't heard their perspective. And it would be very important and very interesting to note what they really think regarding the conversation about hormonal contraceptive use. Maybe they have other different ideas than what people perceive. Yes, so the norm has been that, oh, this is not accepted, this is not accepted. But who knows? Times have changed. People change to suit changing times. So it will be important to also talk to these important stakeholders to know what they perceive and how they can be involved. Since they are key players, they will be very good agents in supporting the implementation of any intervention when they are involved. Okay, so there's a wide group of stakeholders and they all should be targeted somehow. Yes. So how would a prospective intervention look like? What, what, what would you be your most important primary recommendation? So this is, um, in order to target this kind of problem, is a multi-dimensional intervention that is needed. But it also depends on how much we have. So, I've, and, and then also, for these people to intervene, you have to really understand what the problem is first, before you can put in any intervention for the other groups that have not been studied into detail. At least I have studied these girls and I have noted that their problem is with the self-efficacy to access and use hormonal contraceptives could make a change. If they have positive views, personal gain, they view that they could personally gain from using hormonal contraceptives, they would use them. So for an intervention, I'll target the girls themselves. 
and I will target their attitude towards hormonal contrast, personal hormonal contraceptives, which is huge. So the change objective here would be for them to recognize that using hormonal contraceptives, the benefit of it outweighs the negative effect of it. And then through modeling, I will be able to maybe let people do role plays or pre-recorded videos, show them what it feels like, how one can appreciate the personal benefits or gains from using hormonal contraceptives. And probably they could, we could um, change their attitude towards hormonal contraceptive use. Okay. Or maybe using anticipated regret, any of those methods could work in this direction as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Gia Pong, Professor of Applied Health and Social Sciences at the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana. Thank you very much, um, dear candidates, for walking us through your journey um, to unravel issues around the use of hormonal contraceptives amongst candidates. Your presentation was clear, and the piece of work that I read was quite interesting. So thank you for that. Um, but as you have noted in your work, the girls find themselves in a dilemma. They find themselves within a cultural context. They find themselves within a religious context. And they are young children who live under the roof of their parents. Um, my concern is you raising issues about ensuring that the girls are spoken to, advised, are guided to be able to use these contraceptives properly. But we know that um, our traditions die hard and in the Ghanaian society where religion is strong, it can become a problem. You mentioned the issue of stigma because the girls feel that if they use the contraceptives, then everybody talks about the fact that they are bad girls in, in quotes. So um, you've talked also about one of your recommendations, engaging the health service and the health workers. Now within these contextual complexities, culture, religion, stigma, how are you going to guide the health workers? You were a bit silent on the specific interventions that would help uh, overcome some of these barriers. And I want to hit on that hard because the Ghana Health Service would want specific directions as to what to do. Can you help us out? Highly esteemed opponent, first for your compliment and then for your question. So indeed, it is important that all these findings that we have found seem to be rooted in societal, cultural, and religious norms. And we live with this and indeed they are die hard. But we can't also be silent because we notice that the problem of teenage pregnancy is a huge one and which needs all hands on deck to solve it. So I would, among stakeholders, including the community opinion leaders and religious leaders, this is a problem and needs participatory problem solving approach. So by bringing these groups together, we can brainstorm on the problem of teenage pregnancy among adolescents and weigh the benefits and side effects of using hormonal contraceptives and find contextually and culturally appropriate ways of making sure that girls either abstain or use hormonal contraceptives. Because we note that there are lots of children born out of wedlock by adolescent girls and these children have now become a burden on society. They are unable to go to school. Most of them become street children. Most of them are those who sit on these motorbikes and rob. We have huge issues with social vices now coming up in our society. And you can trace some of these problems from their homes, depending on where they are coming from. And most of these happen to be um, children who didn't receive enough support because maybe they were born by adolescent girls who couldn't give them enough opportunity. So I feel that through participatory problem solving approach, advocacy, and um, yeah, we can brainstorm, stakeholders can brainstorm and find solutions to this problem. And for the social norm, we can change it. I won't die, but I think that 
modernization has changed a lot of things. So for if, if we went through something like educational entertainment, we can change social norms. Take, for example, things we do for love. When HIV was at the prime, we, we had that on TV to showcase how people could do the ABCs, abstain, be, use um, contraception, or be faithful to your partner. So through such kind of programs, you are able to reach a wider community, let them know what the problems are and how we can solve these problems together. Because whether we like it or not, it hangs. And it's going to go high. Because if you compare in 2014, about 14% of, uh, of adolescent girls had experienced pregnancy. In 2017, it's about 14.5. Which means that if you are not careful, it will go high and high. And because now you know that our population is very young, the base is very broad, so there are a lot of adolescents, which means that this problem will rather get high. And so these are stakeholders who I believe that are very involved in adolescent development. They should be interested in it. So by discussing these issues, it is possible for us to come to a conclusion to find what will be suitable for our contest and pick it up from there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the response. I'll hand over to the next opponent. Thank you. Touch on the health worker a bit, but. <laughs> We have more time for you if you have another question. Oh, okay. so then you can go on with the health worker bit because that was what I was concerned about. Yeah. Creative. Lots of health workers have received a lot of training about how to tailor reproductive health services to the needs of adolescents. So they are doing well. We recently had a study which we interviewed. Um, health workers who are really working in these adolescent health corners, and they make us understand that they appreciate the challenges, the dilemma, the difficulties that adolescents go through, and so they are happy to help when they come. Because the next time you uh, you realize she will be coming with an uncompleted abortion, which is very risky for her life. So they are interested in supporting girls who say they cannot abstain but at least they can use a contraceptive method to help them. Now the WHO has a checklist to guide the provision of contraception for all manner of uh, people in different categories. It's, it's supposed to guide the provider and guide the recipient or the client of the service. What I notice lacking is that usually when adolescents or even the other people, other stakeholders, other clients go to the facility, the health providers do not use this checklist. I have gone through it myself, how they should do the counseling, what method would work for who, when somebody comes with this particular condition, what kind of contraceptive you are supposed to give. That is missing, that bit is missing. So my, my push would be for that. We should stick to the WHO guidelines. That checklist is, is so useful. If you're able to stick to it and train um, these health workers about how to do their counseling, how to receive people when they come to the facility, is going to go a long way to ensure that people are able to choose the right methods that they want to use, and then they can continuously use them because they like these methods that they have chosen. I mean, they have chosen. Sorry, thank you. You know, our health workers are always complaining about workload. And now you are going to tell them to spend um, long hours, several minutes counseling, going through a long checklist. Um, how do you expect them to be able to cope with that pressure? Because once you sensitize people, a lot more of the girls are going to come to the facilities. How are they going to cope with going step by step through uh, this checklist that you are talking about? About commitment. If you are committed to something, there is always a way out. And that is the level that we should get. Because a lot of people are not committed to their work. And I feel that there are even worse stages in the system. People come to work, they don't sit. They run around, come around, and come back to complain about workload, which is a pity. So I think that the most important thing now would be to get stakeholders, to get committed to whatever you are committed to, you can do it. And that is what we have to do, to get health workers to be committed to this problem. Because if you don't systematically take care through how to use contraception, tomorrow she will come back with an uncompleted abortion. Tomorrow she will come back being pregnant, not even having money to buy the simple medications to take her through her pregnancy and safe delivery. So we have to weigh the problem and then 
come together and fight together against it as stakeholders. Thank you. Where the chiefs and elders are very upset with the health workers for spoiling their children. Uh, you keep talking about stakeholders and engagement. The chief doesn't want to have anything to do with the health workers. How do we solve this? Yes, it still boils back to engage. You see, that is the problem. Most of the time, we feel that we know what is good for people. And we think that everybody should buy in. Once we are the health workers, we know what is good for you. We have brought it, so buy it. It won't work. So for every intervention that doesn't involve important people in the community, it won't work. So where we first have to start from, we have wronged them. We have to <laughs> apologize and bring them on board. If you take your time to explain things to somebody, it's either they refuse to be honest or they are not honest in total. So I feel that if we are able to go back to the opinion leaders and sit down and brainstorm and discuss the problems at hand, they will help find solutions which would be workable. Sometimes what you think as a health worker to do, maybe they have, they have also thought about it, but it's just that we feel that we know too much, so we don't involve them, and that it comes back to bite us. So I'm sure that what we should do going forward for most of these health programs that we do is to really involve the key stakeholders in the community because they are very, very important so that things can work well for us. Okay. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Kuhu, a researcher in Public Health Institute, Tropical Institute Amsterdam, and also with the Youth Harvest Foundation in Ghana. Dr. Kuhu. Thank you, um, dear candidate. Thank you for the work that you have done. Um, I have read your work with very keen interest. And indeed, you have shown that the girls have needs. So it is an important contribution to the issue of teenage pregnancy that is quite important in, in the Ghanaian context. Um, my, I want to piggyback on Prof. Japong's question in relation to religion. Uh, I've, I've seen that in, in both um, study one and, and study three, you have highlighted um, the role of religious belief in prohibiting the use of hormonal contraceptives. And um, my question is related to the bigger role of religion in the Ghanaian society. You are fully aware in the last few years and several years of advocacy to put CSC in the school curriculum got crashed in 2018. And basically because some people do not believe that we should expose children to comprehensive sexual education. Uh, and that belief was linked to what is currently ongoing in, in the Ghanaian uh, parliament, where you are probably aware of a bill that is likely to be passed into law, um, what has been named as the LGBTIQ plus bill uh, that has occupied discussion in Ghana. And um, basically, it seems to go to deepen the belief that we should not provide comprehensive sexuality to young people. And so my question is, looking at your very first finding in study one, which is the limited knowledge, and if you look at what is going on, what do you think we need to do in order to be able to broaden a young people, it's adolescents, uh, to get access to, to the knowledge that they need, for example, to be able to inform the use of hormonal contraceptives. Esteemed opponent, first for your compliment and then for your question. Yes, we know that we are a people governed by norms, cultures, and beliefs. And like you have alluded to, 
Ghana, it's, it's tightly governed by beliefs, especially religious beliefs. And so it is expected that anything that would seem to violate these norms are apprehended. That said, I, I, I think that even though in the face of religious oppositions, assertive girls are able to still assess their methods if they really want to. But back to how to increase the knowledge that adolescents need. I am aware that Ghana has a favorable environmental, a favorable environment for policy. And so the 2015 Adolescent Reproductive Health Policy made provisions for adding SRH topics into, some, into the curriculum. So we know that there are some bits of SRH topics that are covered if you took, for example, biology, management in living at the senior high school level. These are included. It's just that because these are elective subjects, only a few um, adolescents are able to have access to it. And then if you came to the core subjects, it's just, I think, social studies and then integrated science that does this. So the knowledge is not deep. My problem, my, my, I, I go back to second the point that we need to have comprehensive sexuality education as a standalone subject that would start from primary level to senior high school level. But it should be culturally appropriate, culturally sensitive and acceptable, and most importantly, age appropriate. I think that the challenge has been that the reason why the 2018 move to incorporate this didn't work is that I think the, the stakeholder involvement was poor. Because we know that even in the churches, when people become pregnant, they are disfellowshipped. So why can't we promote it such that we all understand where we are and what needs to be done? In my church, I am the leader for young girls. I held one public health uh, program in the church and I declare that I am speaking as a public health expert and not a leader in the church. And then when I gave my talk, one elder who is also high up on the political ladder said that indeed, I think that we have come to a point where we need to discuss these things. And the basic route has to start from the engagement from the lower levels. I'm not sure how extensive the engagement was and that led to this crash, but I feel that engagement is very important. And then I also, I also feel that the content that is taught should be deepened because they are very superficial, As, especially regarding the use of contraceptives. If you took the courses that treated these, they are, they are allotted the least units, the SRA topics that are taught are allotted the least units in the curriculum. And then teachers do not really delve much because there are things that are left out which I think should be included. So in addition to making SRH a comprehensive sexuality education as a standalone subject, which should be age specific and taught from the primary school through to senior high school. I think that what is already taught at the senior high school should be beefed up and should be into detail. And I ask that it started from the lower levels because at the lower level, we have the masses of the girls or adolescent children being enrolled. As people climb up the academic ladder, you see that enrollment shrinks. So when we target them, we catch them young and give them the correct information, the, the detailed knowledge that they are supposed to know. I think that um, it will be the good way to go to target the bigger mass of the people and give them the necessary knowledge that they need. We should do stakeholder involvement, a lot of it, and explain the need for it because it's either of the two whether we give the information or we face the consequences of unintended pregnancies among adolescents. <clears throat> and we are out of time. Do you have a short response? Because we have a time problem. You can res respond shortly. Uh, this is me. Yep. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Yes, okay, so probably just, just um, I, I thought that the belief that teaching young people uh, means in, uh, will indoctrinate them to into LGBTQ essence 
um, is something that you may want to comment on, candidate. Uh, what do you think about that? It's, it's not just even about um, initiating them into LGBT. The huge problem has always been that when you provide sexuality education to children, you are introducing innocent children to what they shouldn't know, and that would make them sexually active. That has been the problem. But there is no scientific evidence to back the claim mm -hmm. that when you give information to children, especially regarding um, sexuality, they practice what they hear. No, it's not the case. Because literature even really shows that children who have the knowledge that they need in terms of sexuality education are able to make the right decision to delay sex, to use contraception if they cannot delay sex, to protect themselves. Okay. And we understand what you say. <laughs> we are in time for problems. So thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Krumer, Professor in Translational Ethnographies and Global Health at this university. Dear candidate, of course, I want to congratulate you and, uh, and the team of advisors uh, with this beautiful book on a very important topic. Um, I have I do not have a lot of experience with this problem in Ghana, but I would like to take you uh, to the work of my colleagues in the Caribbean and in Latin America who have extensively worked uh, with young teenage mothers. And uh, they worked um, different um, uh, than you with life histories. They collected life histories of young mothers to understand how uh, in the course of their lives, they ended up becoming pregnant and uh, then later became uh, single parent women. Uh, but before they did that study, uh, they first looked uh, into the, uh, they did a literature review, systematic literature review to see, uh, to look into the medical aspects. And they found actually that young women um, do not have more complications, or teenage women and mothers do not have more complications than um, women in general, but that uh, because the chance that they belong to a marginalized community, they have a much higher risk uh, of not having access um, to the right uh, services. So that is one uh, issue. Is it, it, is it a problem of the young mothers, or is it a problem of not having uh, enough services in place for this group. And the same goes for another aspect. Um, we are always concerned that young mothers, um, they will spoil their lives if they have a baby too early. Uh, they will not be able to develop uh, their full uh, potential. They cannot finish school, etc. But if you look at the life histories of the women in uh, Caribbean and Dominican countries, you see that uh, the picture is way more uh, complex. Young women, and also older women, they are proud often to be mothers. And as long as they can show that they can provide for their children, um, they have uh, knowledge on how to do that, they have support, uh, the problem is not, uh, not so big. The problem is actually more, uh, they tell me, or they told my colleagues, that once you're pregnant, you're kicked out of school. And that is the end of your education. Once you're a single mother and you live in particular neighborhoods in the bigger towns or in rural areas, uh, but especially if you live in the bigger neighborhoods, there's no support for women to uh, pick up schooling. There's no support for women in terms of what to do with the children during the day. So they tell me there's a lot of um, happiness and a lot of worth in becoming mothers, but there's problems uh, with the support systems. And in a country like Colombia, they now um, combine, of course, uh, education about um, condom use and contraceptives with uh, those kind of support systems. And I was just wondering, can you uh, reflect a little bit from this perspective? How would that be in Ghana? Um, uh, would, would that uh, be a good addition to uh, a focus on education uh, with regard to the use of condoms? Um, is it uh, feasible, possible, and maybe even wise uh, to include in the human uh, and the health and the human and the reproductive health rights, not just 
uh, education and access to contraceptives, but also support uh, once women become mothers, teenage or even a little bit older. Thank you very much. Highly esteemed opponent, first for your compliment and then for your question. So for your first question regarding whether the problems we anticipate towards adolescent pregnancy is biological or social, I think they are both. Science proves that because young girls are young, their organs are not very well developed. And so carrying a child and giving birth has physical challenges for an adolescent. It is very common for an adolescent who gets pregnant to go through very difficult pregnancy in terms of when they are delivering because their pelvis is not very well developed. And beyond that, they usually have high levels of hemorrhage when they are pregnant. They go through several um, consequences, um, medical problems when you are pregnant as an adolescent. So that is the case, at least what I know from the literature. And then the other part also has to do with the social support. Most of the time, by 19 years, girls are still in school. You depend on your parents for support and everything. Once you, you go and get pregnant, it's a difficult problem for the community because usually teenage pregnancy is about people from marginalized communities. You're already from a, a, a household at a slow, with a low social economic income. So once you become pregnant, you have become a burden because you are introducing another person into the family. You are not able to reach where you could have reached potentially because you have dropped out of, most of them drop out of school. So you are not able to continue your education. But then also, there is stigma from your family. We have put you to school to go and learn and you want to marry. So how would you expect to receive the support that you should expect from your parents? It won't come. Your parents would ask you to go to your boyfriend to take care of you. And that's what we heard from our interview. One of the girls said that my parents would drive me away and ask my boyfriend to provide for me, which is usually not possible because these boyfriends are, are their age mates most of the time who cannot take care of themselves and take care of the girls. Therefore, you are unable to access nutrition. Feeding is very poor in this circumstance because you, you cannot provide for yourself. Your boyfriend cannot provide for you. The medication that you're supposed to get to take you through your pregnancy is difficult. You can't get all those support, even the emotional support that you should get, which is very critical. You don't get it. So you get stressed and all these things have influence on the pregnancy. You end up having children with low birth weights and things like that. And so your child is uh, exposed to this risk the mother herself is exposed to this risk. And one, one second, because we, we're running out of time. Uh, Professor Krumer, maybe a short reaction? I understand from uh, medical evidence with regards to Latin America and the Caribbean that uh, risks for uh, teenage mothers are certainly not higher than for uh, other women in poor, who live in poor conditions. Uh, actually that the birth outcomes are better. So I was just wondering how that was in Ghana because of course countries are not the same. Uh, and I, uh, I understand that uh, it's difficult to get support, but the complaint was actually among the women that we talked to is not so much that they don't get, um, 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 yeah, that it's difficult to be a pregnant mother, but that it's because of all kind of support systems lacking. And I was just wondering, and you actually answered that, apparently families uh, are not uh, supportive uh, of their uh, girls, whereas in uh, Caribbean and in uh, Latin America, yeah. apparently a bit more. Yeah, I was just wondering how that was. Yes. Okay, we'll stop here because there's two more opponents. Uh, the next question comes from Dr. Meertens, Associate Professor in Health Promotion at Maastricht University. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, uh, my compliments on the thesis. It's well written. It's a variety of uh, study methods and uh, uh, important topic. And also you found a catchy title for your PhD thesis. 
Uh, but my question, and that's the most important, is, um, is on uh, chapter three. Uh, and I would like to, uh, to ask you uh, something about uh, recruitment of, uh, of uh, participants there. Um, and it is a, it is a, a quite sensitive uh, topic uh, in the community. It is about uh, the use of uh, hormonal contraceptives. Uh, in, uh, you look for participants who have uh, experience in doing that. Uh, so, and that might be sensitive, uh, or is sensitive, probably. Uh, and then you recruit uh, uh, participants via their households, so via their families, their fathers and mothers, and via schools. And I would say then that it's, in fact, that's quite strange for such a sensitive topic. And I could imagine that you end up only with uh, the uh, participants who are really um, a bit se uh, selected participants because they are open while the community, community uh, finds it not so, uh, yeah, not so norm, not so acceptable. So that's at least the beginning. And you say something about that in the discussion, huh? but they also say, okay, maybe this is not that big a problem because I had uh, particip participants from a diversity of backgrounds and I don't think that that solves the problem, problem at all. So please, your opinion. And to leave some last uh, time for the last opponent, maybe don't make it too long. <laughs> Thank you so much. Highly esteemed opponent. First for your compliments and then for your question. Indeed, we noted in our study that the difficulty that we had in this study was to recruit adolescents who use hormonal contraceptives from random places like schools and then in the community. The girls that we recruited from the home were girls who had already participated in a previous study that we did who indicated that they use hormonal contraceptives. And so we based on the information that we had already in our database to contact them. And because we already had that relationship with them, we already done such studies with them, they were they willingly agreed for us to talk to them. And might interest you to know that for most of these girls, their parents are already aware that they use hormonal contraceptives. Also because it was even the initiative of some of these mothers to take their children to the facility to get the methods done for them. So from that point, it wasn't very difficult for us. Now the challenge that we had with going to the school, and also because we went to the school, since we thought that it was a place where we could get lots of girls ranging from different age groups to make it easier for us. So that's why we ventured there. But then we got only a few, also because the topic is sensitive. So even if people were using it, they didn't um, want to come out to say that indeed they were using it. So it was a challenge for us. In as much as we tried to talk to them, on we didn't talk to them together to ask though. But once they, we, we, contacted them, we contacted them through their teachers, who mentioned to them that there were some researchers here who wanted to talk to young girls about hormonal contraceptive use. And so we found a location where those, we, they would come to us and then on one-on-one -on -one basis, we talk about this, we ask them. Most of them said that they were not using it. We only got a few from the school. So that's why we had to resort to recruiting from the family planning clinic. So indeed, it was a huge challenge for us. And next time, I don't think that the schools will be set places to go. But in terms of sensitivity, um, we asked about, it was about talking to them individually and not discussing it as a group. So I think that there was that privacy in terms of dealing on individual basis. Yeah, but you are addressing practical issues and I understand that yeah. very well that sometimes you have to, to re resolve it that way. But my question was more about, uh, then you have a very special group who doesn't find it that sensitive. And that, of course, affects the answers that they will give. They will not say, I'm not doing it because I would feel stigmatized uh, then, because they are open about it. So you, you don't get a real, maybe you don't get a good idea of what is really happening in the whole population. Exactly, exactly. And we noted that as part of the weakness of this work, the fact that it seemed that the girls who opened up were those who already assertive and who were convinced about their hormonal contraceptive use. And so they 
we're happy to talk about it. But we indeed would miss out on those who are a bit reserved and do not want to disclose it. And that's a, a weakness for this study that we would have to find ways of dealing with it another time if we are supposed to do this kind of work. Okay, thank you very much. I guess back to work. <clears throat> then the obsession will be continued by Professor Boss, Professor of Clinical Psychology at the Open University. First of all, uh, I would like to congratulate you with this wonderful, well-written thesis on an important topic and also a relevant context. And uh, it, this research also has uh, important practical implications, but we come on that later. Uh, but of course, just like Professor Zelstra, I'm not here only to uh, give you compliments, but also to ask you some questions. And we only have five minutes, so I'll do that quickly. Uh, my first question is about chapters two and five. In chapter two, you find that fear of disclosure of use and fear of societal stigma related to sexual intercourse may explain why adolescent girls do not use hormonal contraceptive methods. And then we come to chapter five, and uh, you do not include fear of societal stigma or fear of disclosure of use as a determinant. So my first question is, why did you not measure these determinants in your quantitative study? Thank you very much, highly esteemed opponent, for your compliment and then for your question. Indeed, I did include um, attitude towards hormonal contraceptive products as um, a determinant to be examined. And then the point about stigma, no, I didn't include it. I think that um, <laughs> it was rather captioned as norms and religious beliefs, which I thought would bring out the issues regarding stigma. But that, that doesn't seem to be much of a problem among the girls. Because I was looking rather at religious norms and how they would influence hormonal contraceptives am among them. But in the correlation, there was a very weak association between mm. religious norms and hormonal contraceptive use. And that was very, very surprising to me yeah, but why if you, that happened. If you would have measured it more directly, yes. the societal stigma, maybe then it was more clear what you exactly, exactly. meant. W w would you then expect uh, some effects? Or? Yes. I think if I had directly measured it, I would have found something very interesting. It's unfortunate that I didn't specifically measure the attitude of society and how mm. you would feel if you were using hormonal contraceptives. Yeah. Well, that, was, that was a, a weakness. Yeah. <laughs> what, what you did measure was discussing sexual rights and health issues with your mother or with other persons. That might be a kind of proxy that is a little bit close to, to stigma. Do you see that that way or, or not? Yes, could be. Yeah, yes. but, but there the effects were not, uh, not it present. It would. Yeah. Yes. The, the, oh. yeah, it would. Okay, then I, I go to that in the same study to okay. table four. There it shows that attitude, self-efficacy, and self-regulation skills are the important determinants of intention to use hormon hormonal contraceptives. And now I wondered, if you would design an intervention, would you focus on these three factors, on attitude, self-efficacy, and self-regulation skills? Or would you also focus on reducing stigma and creating a better so social context in which adolescent uh, girls could be open about the use of horm hormonal contraceptives? I think that most of these issues in terms of the self-efficacy and then the attitudes and self-regulation all are rooted in societal stigma. Because people will not go to the facility to get the method because mm -hmm. they fear that they will be stigmatized. So it's not really about, for me, I think it's not really about them not having the internal confidence, but it is the outcome of what they would experience if they go. That's why they won't go, and that is the stigma. And then their, their attitude towards hormonal contraception is also negative because they feel that when they use it, they'll be seen as bad girls, so they'll be stigmatized against. And then about self-regulation, whether they are able to use it such that people won't see all those ones, I think, that are rooted in stigma. So indeed, once we are able to, if we, if we got the funding, it will be very, very important to also include a bit about stigma in this, mm -hmm. how to deal with whether it's perceived stigma, whether it's internal, internalized stigma, it will be very important to deal with yeah. these as well. 
But still you think that attitude, self-efficacy and those skills are important targets for an yes. intervention? Yes, I do, because yeah. these, these are very important. They came out strongly in predicting hormonal contrast yeah. use perceptions. Among it, earlier in your thesis, you also said, uh, it was, I think it was the discussion of chapter two, that you mentioned that uh, interventions targeting parents and improving parent-child communication on sexuality-related matters may be a solution. So that's another type of intervention. Um, can you tell me more about that? Uh, how would you develop such an uh, intervention? And what kind of methods would you use to improve the parent-child communication? Okay, so in terms of dealing with an interventions for an environmental, at the environmental level, which in this case the parent is an environmental agent, is about advocacy, and I think about brainstorming. Mm -hmm. It's about how to help parents to understand the problems of adolescence. Thank you. Ellen Boama Kali. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The Dewey Committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the mileage, Yeah. 
years can fly by now, don't waste all your time Cause I'll go, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile
<clears throat> Ellen Boema Kali. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your defense, the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdicts and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Ruiter is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisors now to take the floor. All right. And Dear candidate, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, please, I do. Thank you. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Ellen Abravi Bohama Kali, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Thank you. Dr. Boema Kali, yes. also on behalf of, oh, sorry, <laughs> order. I think we all need coffee. <laughs> Ellen. Yes, right. Ellen. Ellen. Dr. Ellen Boema, now it is official. <laughs> After all the hard work, you have no idea how proud I am that you manage and that you, that you did not give up this challenge. Because a challenge it has been. We came in touch via John Kruger, one of my former PhD students. It seems his experiences doing a PhD on the my supervision were positive enough to convince you to do the same. We started to work together more or less at the same time that Marta started in 2017. The topic of teenage pregnancy was your personal interest, because teenage sexuality and pregnancy is a big issue in Ghana. We discussed ideas and decided to focus on hormonal contraceptive use or family planning, as it is called in Ghana, instead of condom use to prevent teenage pregnancies, because it is a research area that is far less explored. You wrote it down nicely in a research proposal for which we planned to get funding. But there started the first challenge, the big challenge. For us, it was very clear and common sense that determinants of hormonal contraceptive use are very different from the determinants of condom use and thus important and necessary to study. However, I lost count in the number of grant applications we applied for to try to convince the financiers of this important research area. It did not work out. But you did not give up. And due to your own high levels of self-efficacy and planning skills and the emotional and instrumental support from your environment, you decided to continue your own PhD without any grant funding. And personally, I don't know any other PhD student who did the same. That is a great example of dedication and having high future ambitions. Next page. But there were more challenges. Finding girls willing to talk about hormonal contraceptives. And then also the hormonal contraceptives that we want to study and not the emergency pill. Combining a PhD with an almost full-time job at KHRC, supervisors at distance, changing jobs, corona on top of it all, and then the struggle for your own family planning. First, trying to get a family, then the great news that you got pregnant, two lovely sons, but two times a tough pregnancy. And then managing this family life between two very busy and ambitious parents. It was hard. It was stressful. Often I was worried you would give up, but you conquered. You triumphed, 
you succeeded. And look at you now, a mother, a wife, and a PhD. Moreover, all chapters published. I personally don't know any PhD who got all her chapters published before the actual defense. You yourself are the best inspiration for all the teenage girls. I hope they follow your example. Fun memories we have too. Dinners at your place, in which you tried to make me eat the real Ghana food. I did my best, but I did not really succeed. All the in-depth conversations and discussions we had about life, religion, and the role of men and husbands. We did not always agree, but we always respected each other's ideas. The good thing, today I have the last word. <laughs> and of course, all the small scale PhD interventions I tried to implement to influence your exercise and pollution behavior. <laughs> Walking to KHRC, the excuse that your laptop was too heavy and you had back problems, but then your husband got involved and was willing to deliver your laptop by car to the office. Last weekend, when you and Marta were visiting me in Woerden, I understood that the exercise intervention has been successful. You're now walking to the office. The other one is still a work in progress, I guess. <laughs> Ellen, it was a great pleasure to work with you, and I'm very happy that we can finish this adventure all together, you, Marta, me, on the same day. Thanks also to the great support of all other people involved, Rob Ruiter, Professor Owi, Dr. Asante, and all other colleagues from KHRC, and not last but not least, the master students from Maastricht University that helped in data collection, Lisa, Lina, and Marloes. I hope this closed adventure opens the door for new, maybe even better adventures, especially now you have reminded me this weekend of all the nice things that Ghana has to offer for tourists that I could have seen, but didn't. Congrats again for you, but also for your partner, family, colleagues, and now it's time for a break and a party. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Boema Kali, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. And with this, we are come to the end of this academic ceremony. And you already know what a follow-up is. You are going to make pictures and you're going to talk to your online people, but congratulations. Okay, thank you very much.